So my name is Chairman Root. I'm here from Google to talk to you a little bit about Clang, um, specifically about refactoring C++ with Clang. Uh, just first quick question, how many folks here have heard of Clang before? All right, how many folks here are asleep? Okay, just, that, that's about what I expect, just checking, okay. So if you haven't heard about Clang before, I'm sorry I can't help you. You should go, you should go, you should go learn about Clang, it's an amazing tool. But I'm, I'm going to be talking about something very specific, and that's refactoring. Now, you guys do know what refactoring is. Anyone does not know what refactoring is? Okay, good, good. That simplifies this talk. So, the real goal of refactoring C++ is to make C++ a much more fun language. Uh, right now, C++ is, it can be annoying, right? And, and this isn't too surprising, right? C++ has some pretty clear priorities, right? And, you know, it's really good at some of these things. It's, it's got fantastic performance. It's, it's pretty good with product, productivity, right? It's got a lot of generic solutions. It's got a lot of things in its libraries that help you be productive. But it also has some shortcomings. Um, and when you get down to fun, things are a little bit more grim for C++. C++ is not the world's most fun language to write code in. And we think that's something we can change. We can make C++ much more fun and exciting language to write code in. Um, and, and you can kind of see the fundamental problem. If you've ever worked in an open source community, you've probably seen discussions like this, right? Someone comes along with this great new feature. It's fantastic. It's wonderful. Then there's some pedantic person on the mailing list, sometimes this is me, right, like actually jumping in and saying like, actually you, you've done it all wrong, you need to go and reflow all your code, you have to go and fix a bunch of things. And this is tedious, right, this is make work, this isn't something interesting, this isn't exciting or fun to go and fix. And this is what, you know, kind of holds C++ back a lot of things. It's a lot of small, annoying things. We're not talking about massive missing features, we're talking about the small, everyday annoyances. So there's a good way to solve these types of annoyances, and those, that's through tooling and automation. It's a pretty you know, traditional approach to it. So some of the things that we want to get out of this are automatic code formatting. You want, the, you want to make sure that all of the code formatting busy work just vanishes from your life. Right? Renaming things, you know, moving things around. These are very mechanical operations, but they can be very painstaking and time consuming to perform. And it's really important that we can perform them easily and quickly when we need to. And we also want to support boilerplate generation, right? We want to be able to generate the structure and the form of the code, the ceremony that has to go with something without you having to do a lot of work. These are all really, really important concepts to solve through tooling and automation. And that's, those are the kinds of things we're looking to solve with Clang. Now, unfortunately, this is not easy. This is actually quite hard to solve. The first problem we run into when you do this is that there's a cross-translation unit barrier here. A lot of operations that we're talking about here, they don't actually fit within a single translation unit or a single file of code. You've got to have a broader perspective. You've got to have you know, infrastructure to handle that broader perspective in order for your, your tools to be effective. You have to integrate with lots of build systems and editors all over the place. They're all different. They all work ever so slightly differently, right? And you can't change these things. A lot of people have tried to build uh, C++ tools by saying, well, if you use our build system and our editor in our integrated development environment, then you'll be able to have these facilities. But that doesn't scale very well to the C++ development community. It's a very diverse community. They have different tools, different platforms, different operating systems. And frankly, I never, ever want to try and remove Emacs from anyone's hands, okay? I understand how poorly that will go. So we have to actually integrate with lots of different systems in order for this to be a compelling solution. It also has to be really fast. This is something people tend to overlook. A slow tool is a useless tool. The whole point of this was to make things fun and easy for programmers. If they have to sit there waiting for their tool, that undermines and undercuts every single thing you're trying to achieve. So you have to have really good performance. And these are, the, these are kind of the challenges that you know, crystallized uh, the solution that we were building on top of Clang. So let's talk a little bit about that solution. I just want to give you guys kind of a high-level overview of the architecture we're building and the platform we're building on top of Clang to solve these problems. If you start with Clang, all of the things in Clang, there are lots of talks that have gone into the architecture of Clang. I'm not going to repeat a lot of that here. Right? Understand that Clang is a modular, modern C++ compiler. It has all the semantic analysis and all the other fun bits you would expect in a compiler. On top of Clang, we're going to start building libraries. Right, library components that are specific to, the, to building tools. Right? You have a tooling library that helps you with the very core infrastructure of building a tool and running a tool over code. We have a refactoring library to kind of encapsulate all of the, the, the tricky parts of changing a piece of source code from one piece of textual representation to another. And we also have something called the AST matches. And why this separate library is necessary is really not clear at first. 
We're going we're to talk a lot more about the ASD matrix throughout the lecture. These are essentially how we navigate the structural representation of C++ code. So when you tie all these together, you get kind of the now augmented Clang platform, right? This is how we've augmented Clang's library platform to support building tools, building refactoring tools, and building other kind of code analysis tools. Now, on top of this platform, we need to actually go one step further and build some uh, integration layers, right? We need ways to get your tool logic connected with the actual developer who's using the tool. And this takes different forms that are really tailored to the different use cases we have. The first one I want to talk about are plugins, right? And we plugins are not a new thing to compilers. GCC actually has had plugins for about as long as Clang has been able to parse C++ code. It's not really a new thing. But they're really an important use case. Plugins handle the use case when you want to augment the act of, the act of compilation. It's not a separate tool that you want. It's a tool that actually goes along with the compiler on every single compilation. So it's really useful if you have uh, some form of you know, static checking that is absolutely critical. You can never allow this checking to be missed, and so you want it to happen on every single compile. It's also useful if you have some form of language augmentation where you want to generate extra code or auxiliary data every time you compile with your source code. Now, the second uh, kind of path of integrating an actual tool into the developer workflow is called libclang. Right? Now, this is a C stable library that the Clang developers have built, encapsulating a lot of the logic inside of this platform to try and allow external tools to link safely against the entire Clang platform. Right? Now, libclang is a C library for ABI stability and for API stability and for interlanguage use cases. It's really, really nice if you have to do a foreign function interface, you have to reach out from one language to another. Python bindings are built on top of libclang, right? The, the integration that, that happens inside of Xcode, Apple's IDE, is built on top of libclang because it allows them to integrate with Objective-C. This makes for a really nice, high-level and, and, and very straightforward integration layer, but it has one uh, very <coughs> important presumption, and that is that Whatever tool is doing this integration, whatever tool is linking in libclang, is a long-lived entity. Right? It's something that's going to actually run and keep running and keep running, and it's going to kind of be a monolithic entity managing all of the clang operations that are going on. Now that fits perfectly with the IDE model, right? and that's where it was developed for. But there are other use cases that we need to support as well. And that's why we're starting to build infrastructure around standalone tools. Okay? These are tools that are not part of an IDE, they're not part of some integrated system. Instead, they stand on their own, they often take the form of command line tools, and they can be integrated independently, and they can also be integrated into multiple different editors and development environments. And those are really, really important to us. All right, now that we've gotten this, so first off, questions about this platform? I'm happy to take questions throughout the entire talk. Okay, everyone's just really happy with this, okay. So now we're gonna talk about standalone tools. Okay? And I'm, I'm going to spend most of my time talking about standalone refactoring tools because I think that's the most applicable to people in this audience. Um, in particular, uh, we're going to take a case study, and that is the idea of refactoring APIs. And I don't mean refactoring in, in some of the senses that you might be familiar with from like Fowler's where you're trying to do extract method or simply renaming things, but really deep refactorings. The, the use case I want you to keep in mind is imagine that you, you're the author of, of a fantastic boost library to the author of a fantastic boost library from five years ago. And unfortunately, it has not aged well. And you, as a good citizen, are trying to build a new library that has a much better interface based on all the lessons you've learned from the old interface. But you have a problem. Right? You have a large body of programs out there that are using this old interface, that are expecting that old interface to be maintained and supported for a long period of time. But, and you would like to move them onto your new interface. That's the use case that I want you to keep in mind here, the idea of API migration, API updates, because this is one of the most powerful things you can do on top of this standalone tool platform. And it's something that there simply are no other alternatives out there for, right? There, there's really no other technology that's going to allow you to do this today. So with that, I'm going to give you my, my complete straw man interface. And I, I want to emphasize, there have been several talks that have said this, but it bears repeating. The, the code I have on a slide is designed to fit on a slide. It is not designed to be representative, okay? Imagine that there's actually a complex and interesting interface here, not a very silly interface like I'm using. This is just useful for a presentation. Okay, so this is my interface. 
right? And here we have a base class, which I haven't shown you, but you can kind of figure out what it does. It has a virtual method called get, right? You get returns something, which is not too surprising, right? And, and you know, I'm, I'm subclassing it and implementing it here. All of this seems perfectly reasonable. Make sense? Seems like something that's kind of sort of reasonable. But there's a problem with this get. The get name isn't really representative. You know, if what this is, if this elements is trying to model some kind of container, this doesn't tell me what element I've gotten out of it. It just says get some element. And I might want to be much more explicit. I might want to this to be front. Like this, this is actually the first element in the container. Okay. So now we have you know, a bad API that we'd like to transform into a good API. Make sense? All right, so we'd like to build some automated system for doing this. Now, when we go and start thinking about how to solve this problem, the first thing we're going to need is we're going to need, well, we're going to need a tool that does anything at all. So the first step is we need to understand that fundamental tooling library and how you can use it to build an actual tool that runs over your code. And for that, we're going to start diving into actual source code. Um, so when you, when you go and you start writing a tool using our library, there's a really great framework available to try and make it easy to write simple and straightforward tools. It provides all the kind of basic primitives you would expect when you're writing a program, right? We've got a command line parsing library. There are lots of other you know, primitive <coughs> libraries available. As it's a nice and rich framework to start writing your program in. And eventually you get to your actual program, and it's going to start looking something like this. And I'm going to, I'm going to try and step through every component of this program. And, and this really is, this is the end of the program, okay? And we're going to explain how all these pieces come together to build an actual refactoring tool. Okay. The very first thing we do, right, is we, we parse out command line options. That's nothing too fancy. But this lets us, you know, configure and set up our, our entire system. And then we're going to do um, probably the most fundamental part of the tooling infrastructure library that we've added to Clay. And that is to build up this idea of a compilation database. Okay, and that's, this, this, is a, this is an LVM weird uh, fake unique pointer. I, I don't know why they decided not to you know, model it on the real one. but so, so we're building up a compilation database, and we're doing that by loading it from a directory. And what this loading it from a directory means is we're actually going to go, we're going to find the directory where you built your project, right? The actual build tree of your project. And we're going to look in that directory for artifacts left over by the build system that tell us how to compile your source code. If we don't know how to compile your source code, we can't analyze your source code. And if we can't analyze your source code, we can't refactor it. So we've got to actually go in and kind of mine the build system for this information. And the way we do this, we've actually gone in and modified build systems to produce a generic and independent uh, protocol for telling tools like this about how your compilations proceed. So we modified CMake um, as kind of a prototype. We modified CMake to, when you, when you build your project, it drops out a JSON database of the compilations that take place. And it looks something like this. It has the directory in which the compilation took place, the command used to actually do the compilation, and what file is being compiled. Right? Very, very straightforward. It allows us to kind of map a source file to a particular compilation. It allows us to figure out how to run the compilation and how to actually understand your source code. Does this make sense? Questions about compilation database? Everybody good. Wonderful. All right, so once we've got this compilation database, we've loaded it up, we understand how to compile your source code, right? We go through and we, and we build a refactoring tool. The refactoring tool is just going to be kind of the driver. It's what's going to manage going off, running all of Clang's infrastructure, compiling the source code that's necessary, building ASTs, and running your tool over it. All right, and so what, what's really important here are these magic dots. So we have some magic dots here and here. We need to fill in those dots in order to have a tool. But this is the skeleton, all right? This is the tooling library skeleton that all of the standalone tools fit into. <coughs> Make sense? OK, so let's start fleshing out the skeleton. Because we do need some magic in here. And the important magic that we need is how do we actually navigate the structure of a program, find the entity that concerns us, and construct a refactoring to the desired end result, right? That's, that's the magic that we've left out here. So we're going to step through that magic. Now, one of the important things is that it turned out when we tried to write these tools by hand, actually doing the refactoring, rewriting source code to have a different string of text was remarkably easy, 
We did that in one day, okay? There's nothing interesting to it. It's text processing. We know how to do text processing. That's not the hard part. The hard part is actually the structural manipulation of the existing code. Finding the exact right part of your program to manipulate and transform the refactoring. And so that's what we spent a lot of time on, and that's what I really call the magic of this entire system. And that magic's kind of encapsulated in this idea of an AST matcher library. Now this library forms a library of predicates over Clang's ASTs, right? It's a predicate library over Clang's ASTs. We formulate it as a predicate library so that we can build up a very large predicate without actually looking at any source code at all. And then we can hand it off to the infrastructure, which runs it over the source code in actually an optimized way, finds places that structurally match, and it calls back to your actual code to handle it. The predicate library makes it much easier to compose all of the things you're trying to match structurally without having to do it in a kind of iterative process, right? You know, if, if, you, if you listen to Sean talk this morning, right, we don't want loops. We don't want to be looping over data structures. We can actually express this entire thing as an algorithm. Okay, so to explain how this predicate library works, because it's probably the most complex part of this entire system, I'm going to walk through a very simplified example and show you how we kind of build up these predicates. So the code snippet I'm going to walk through here is just four statements, right? We've got um, you know, some assignment, method call, different method call, other assignment. Now, clearly the thing we're looking for is what we've got <coughs> outlined in green here, right? We want to find the get call on one of these elements containers. So let's see how we do that. The first step is we're going to build up the kind of most primitive matcher we might want for this particular example. We're going to look for calls, okay? When we look for calls, we're going to find a lot of things we didn't want. So everything that's green would actually be matched here. Throughout this entire example, everything that's green is going to be matched by the predicate that I have that I've built up here. We need to restrict this further. The way we start restricting this is actually we need to narrow the domain of our predicate. So this doesn't actually remove any of these matches, but it allows us to write more predicates about this component of what we've matched, the call lead. All right? Does that make some sense? Mm -hmm. So now we can add a predicate on that callee. We can say that this callee has to be a method, not just a function. And immediately the global function <coughs> falls out of the set of matched entities, right? Now we're only matching methods. OK, let's, let's add another predicate. It's not just a method. It's a method that has a particular name. That name is get, OK? Now we've narrowed it a bit further. So we're closing in on that <coughs> one thing we want. But now we've hit, we, so up until now, we've been in, in regular expression land, right? This is what you might possibly do with text processing. But now we need to write a query which has no textual basis, because the only way to distinguish these two is in the type system, right? And so we have to get more interesting. So again, we're going to create a scope for narrowing our predicates. So we're going to focus a predicate on the this pointer type, right? Once we focus on the this pointer type, we can fill in a predicate that actually pins exactly the thing we're looking for. We want it to be a class. We want it to be a class which is derived from element space. Make sense? Yes? Um, are we really looking for the call, or are we looking for the method itself? I mean, we're going to get there. We're going to get there. For this example, we're looking at the call. But yes, yeah, cer certainly there are more things we need to look for. OK. Um, if you haven't used method there, and you did um, it would actually imply that it's a method. Um, <coughs> I'm trying to show matchers. Yeah, you could probably write this more densely. Other questions? Yes? I get that also namespace matches. Uh, yes, there are namespace matches. You can actually use uh, qualified names here. And if there's any qualifiers in it, we actually run some of claims code over the text that you give it. And we look for qualified name syntax. We find that. We ask for the qualified name. And we enforce a more strict match. If you give it an unqualified, right, you do a looser match. There are lots of different ways to compose this. Yes? Is there any uh, dependency on the order of the predicates? Is there any dependency on the order of the predicates? Um, there is, in a sense. Um, so you, don't, you can't see it here. <clears throat> Eventually, you'll be able to see it because we have combining predicates, like any of or all of. And with any of, the order actually matters because it's going to be first match wins. 
And that can be very important because some matches have different effects from other matches. And we're, we're going to see how that can actually play into things. When there is an order constraint, it's first match wins. But the way these are applied, because we're building up a predicate, it's, it's applied holistically. The entire predicate has to match a particular node in the AST, or it doesn't match. Yes? So um, thinking about your, your, your source code example and this, um, is derived from element space means it wouldn't catch the definition of get in element space. I'm so glad you asked that question, Marshall. It turns out that we don't use a, a, a strictly derives from definition. We actually include, when we say is derived from, uh, we actually define this predicate <coughs> to specifically say is derived from or is equal to because every single person that wanted is derived from wanted to match the base class. It took us quite a while to find a single person who wanted to not match the base class. And actually, that, that's easier to do with a, an additional predicate. Okay. Oh, yeah, you could just say end is not. Yeah. So call is very adequate. Yes, it's very odd. Okay. And actually, that's exactly how it was based up in the standard behaves. Yeah, so it was based, it, we, we, we built this by looking at his base up. <laughs> yes. And you can <coughs> the, the argument types and count as well? Just, just, there are a lot more matchers here. I, I can't go into all of the matchers here. Yes, you, you can go in. I, I'm going to show you some more complex matchers toward the end. Other questions? Yes. Is call a type name or a function name? That's a good question. It's actually a function name. Um, we wanted it to be a type name, but it's very hard to use a type name for this because we actually want to do um, type deduction. And so we make all of these functions, and then they return um, objects, which then build up into a tree structure that we, we can optimize and hand to the matcher later. Other questions? Oh, right. So we've got some magic now. Let's go and use this magic to actually implement the rest of our tool. So we, we now need to go in. So where we had the, that magic and that ellipsis, we're going to plug in our magic here. Before we can plug it in, we need to have something to plug it into. And we need two things here. We need what's called a match finder. This actually holds all of the trees of match or predicates that are active in the system. And we need a callback. And this one's going to be called call renamer, which is our little callback, to actually do something when we discover a match. Okay, this, is, this is the action. And we're going to get to see what the definition of this looks like. Then we add a matcher. We, we give it the, and it's the exact matcher that we wrote up, right? And we give it the callback so that we can actually take action when this happens. Okay, so now we've got a matcher here. So now our main function is essentially complete, right? <coughs> we've, we've handed this, this match finder into the, the tooling infrastructure. When we do this here, this will actually go and run the matcher over all the ASTs in each of the different translation units and collect all the results. Sound good so far? Fairly happy? All right. So what is this renamer doing? So the renamer is, is the callback. And the callback has one interesting role here. Right? So first off, it has the kind of expected things. Right? You have a virtual function. right? And this, is, this has an interface that we expect because we don't have lambdas. right? So we designed this before there were lambdas. Otherwise, this would get much, much simpler. And it accepts this weird result object. All right. This result object contains information about the AST node, which was matched. And one thing we discovered was that if we just, if we just pass the node in here, you end up having to write a whole pile of boilerplate code inside of your callback in order to extract the various different components of that subtree of the AST. In fact, you had to write all the exact code that we didn't want you to write and we built the matchers to avoid. because. This, you actually have the same problem in extracting the information as you do in identifying the interesting information. And so in order to populate this with a lot more interesting results, we actually need to take a step back to our, our matcher and add some additional information. And it's this extra predicate here that we need to add. So as an extra predicate on the callee, we add a bound matcher. So this ID here, this will match anything. Um, it just matches anything that its submatcher matches, but it associates it with a name, in this case, member. Right? And this allows us to really quickly build up the data structure of, of each individual interesting part of the tree that we matched. Okay? And this gets back to your order question. The only place where order really matters is here, because if you, if you have an any of matcher, if you're taking the first one of several different options, only the one we actually take has its 
nodes bound to the, to the names. And so that can matter, but it's very, very unusual. Most of the time, the order doesn't matter. Making some sense? Vaguely happy with this? OK. Now, let's look at how this actual callback is implemented. OK? So this is, this is the callback that's going to go through and replace the, te the, the text. And I, this is, I think, my favorite part of the framework because it was so easy. We had this on day one, and it just works. You pull out the node, right, and this is looking up that bound node that we had by, by its name, and then you add in a replacement. You have to pass some boilerplate around, and this is a blob of text. This is a blob of code that just gets the exact range of characters that make up that name of the function in the member expression. Make sense? You replace it, and you're done. Yes? I missed where that replace object came from. <coughs> Let's back up a little bit. So the replace object is something we pass into the callback, right? And we construct the callback with it. We back up still further. We pass it out of the tool. So the tooling infrastructure provides this replacement object, right? And this is an object that kind of aggregates together, edits to files, keeps track of all of them over time. After all of the edits have been you know, computed, it goes back over all the files, applies the edits in one pass. It detects conflicts. So one of the tricky parts of this is what happens when you have two edits and they actually overlap in the text where they modify each other? Or what if they don't actually overlap in the text, they just seem to overlap in the text, right? This can get, this can get into really hairy problems with macro expansions. And so the replacements object has a lot of smarts to actually understand the different replacements that you're giving it, to reject any edits to the source code that have problems, log errors. Yeah. Uh, you actually bring up, a good, bring up a good point. You can find macro calls with this? Oh, yes, absolutely. Or, and can you also search the code post macro expansion? So, so OK, <coughs> that's a good question. Let me brief aside. So the way Clang parses source code, as it's, as it's lexing all the source code, builds up a source location data structure. And the source location data structure consists of a very small key into a, a tree, an expansion tree, for where that particular piece of code came from. And this keeps track of each layer of macro expansion. It keeps track of both where that macro is expanded to and where the text that made up that expansion was written in a file. Right? And you can actually walk both, direct, both you know, directions of this independently, iteratively. It even keeps track of how macro arguments are expanded first into the macro definition, and then that expanded back to where it's used. So, so yes, you can reconstruct any of the various layers of information you want. Here. And your replacer will actually replace the method call inside a macro definition. Yes, precisely. Other questions? Yes? And there must be some tooling to be able to interactive, inter, uh, iteratively build up these uh, match in other words, as I'm building them, can I see my map easily before I run it? This is the, this is the single most requested feature. <laughs> ah, okay. I um, it was me. We don't have it yet. Um, well, why not? <laughs> because it's hard to write. Um, we, we, we have a prototype for it. It, it has some unfortunate trade-offs. For example, the prototype isn't type safe. The matchers, one thing you, you don't notice when you look at this, you can't just put any predicate here. Um, call is very addict, but it accepts a particular type as its argument. And the, the set of things which actually produce a, a, a predicate object of a compatible type is restricted. So that they actually get static type checking for each layer of this predicate. And that, that's really, really important for catching just completely meaningless predicates early. And all of the dynamic systems that people have built don't actually have that. And right now the best idea for how to build one is to use Clang itself to um, actually build one by running over the implementation of the AST matchers. Um, we haven't gotten there yet. It, it's a lot of work. Um, Had several questions. Uh, yeah, are you ready for a question about micro? Let, let me finish the AST ones. Yeah, go ahead. Just in general, how much, how well is this documented? It's pretty well uh, documented, but not as well as it should be. I mean, be. all of these different uh, parts? And all they have lots and lots of comments. <laughs> Most of the documentation is in comments. We're working on actually building proper documentation, but this is this is relatively new. Uh, for the past six months, we've been working on moving this from a research project to part of the open source claim project. And so that's been our primary focus, and we're actually now starting to write proper documentation for it because it landed in the open source project. So documentation is actively being added. Go on, macros. What do you have? 
I'm um, uh, uh, trying to think about a refactoring situation. I mean, we, we're trying to replace get for other space. And I have a macro that says do get x dot, you know, x dot get. Mm -hmm. And I call it macro sometimes for an element space like that, and sometimes for something else. Yes. So when you refactor, what's going to happen? That depends. There are, a lot, there are a lot of options there. So one of the things we can do is we can actually detect when you're inside of a macro expansion and prevent rewriting the macro definition. Um, the other thing that we, we're looking at doing is actually rejecting edits when a subsequent recompile finds compilation errors. And so we would edit the macro definition and we try compiling it again. We reject it because you know other people, other places aren't using the same interface. And we'd like, okay, that edit's bad. There are a lot of options for how we handle that. Um, There's an option to just expand macro and get the edit. Um, that's always an option, but you have to actually write explicit logic to do that. We don't do that automatically because there are a lot of cases where that's not the right choice. So essentially, what we're trying to do is once you hit macros and you have these things, we don't want to have. Uh, too much in the way of default behavior. We instead want to kind of, you know, like, we have very simple default behavior that's easy to explain. If you want something more complex, here are the tools. Yes, quickly. So this uh, creates a expression template? Uh, essentially, yes. And it must conform to a certain grammar? Yes. So do you use Boost, boost Proto? <laughs> no. <laughs> um, if you want to know why, it's because it's not, it's not an expression template in the more traditional sense. Um, it, it, one of, the, one of the interesting things is it's actually very easily implemented by uh, uh, using non-templated implementations um, because all the predicates are doing essentially the same thing. They just have slightly different par parameterization. And so it's not, I don't know that it would be a perfect fit for Boost Proto, but also none of the people writing this knew Boost Proto, and so, yeah. Um, yes? Is there also an end and or attitude for the matcher? So could, Say again? Um, could you compose expressions for the matcher, like, Looking for a call or yes, a there's function. an any of and an all of which are kind of combining, and there are a lot more matchers. I, I can't go into all the matchers. <laughs> there, there there are hundreds of matcher predicates, um, that, and they compose. That's a whole different topic. Anyways, I want to keep going because I've got some more really fun examples I want to get to. All right, so we've written this. It's done the rewrite. Now, as someone mentioned, we don't want to just match calls. We're going to need another matcher, and so this is the other half of the magic. And this is matching declarations of this method, right? If you walk through it really quickly here, we will want to match a method which has a name get, and it's a method of a class which is derived from element base. Make sense? Not too hard to follow there. Yes? So you're adding this to the finder, meaning it's an or? Kind yes, of so this is an interesting thing. So we're adding this to the same finder. You can add as many predicates as you want to the finder. Each one is matched independently, and the callback fires independently. And so it's particularly nice because you often are matching in separate domains. For example, one was a matcher over expressions, this one's over declarations. They're never going to collide, you just want to do all of them at the same time. It's a really big efficiency win. Alright, so this one has a run that looks a little bit different, but not very much different. The only difference is here is we have a different type coming out of the result, and we have a different expression to compute the actual range. And if we were actually writing this and we actually cared about this, clearly we would factor these out because this is a really trivial thing to abstract away. Sound good? All right. So that actually is all there is. And I have actually a live demo that I'll show you if I have time, but I'm running a little bit low on time. I have a live demo of this. It does work. All this code is checked in. But I also wanted to show you guys what a real matcher for a real problem looks like, because these are a little bit contrived. So this is a real matcher from a tool we built. And this tool is uh, actually, I think, one of my favorite tools. What it does is it looks at your code, and it looks for places where you have an expression, right? And this expression um, calls the cster uh, member function on a string object, and the result of that is then passed into a context that accepts a string object, right? <laughs> this is really easy to do if, you know, at one point you're refactoring one part of your code, you switch to certain string, and then, you know, you realize, oh, gosh, there's that other code that's old and still accepts a care star. Ah, uh, fine, cster, done. Right? And then, you know, two months later, some other person comes along, refactors the other side, and, you know, changes its interface, except the said string. Well, nothing, like, it still compiles just fine, but wow, is that a waste, right? <laughs> We're now, like, like, copying data everywhere, running Sterling over it. The worst part is, sometimes, this has different behavior. If you have null characters in your string, you get a different result, all right? So we built a tool to go and detect all of this and to actually rewrite it to just pass the string object through. Um, this found thousands of instances of this pattern in our code base. 
All right, we ran it over Clang and LLVM's code, which is a relatively small project, right? And it found about 50 instances of it just in that project alone. Okay, so this is like, humans are bad at spotting this, right? Because it works, okay? So what this does is it goes through, it says, okay, we want to find a constructor call, right? And the constructor call is a string constructor, right? It has two, it's the two argument form of the string constructor. The first argument um, is a call of a member which is, a, which is a C string method, and these are just string constants that we've, we've you know, hoisted out here. And it's on some, some argument, some argument expression. And the second argument is actually the default argument. The user didn't write it, right, because you, know, you have to be very careful here. It's a two argument form of a constructor, and it's not valid to replace any cases where the person actually passes an allocator in. Right? So we catch that, and the only, it's only fires when the default argument is used for the second one. Yeah? So you can actually match against implicit calls. Yes, and that is a key realization we've had. When we presented this to a bunch of people, they immediately said, like, oh, well, come on, I don't want to write this giant predicate. What I want to write is C++ code, but with patterns in it. And then just, to, like, to, to pattern match it against the code and find things. This, th there, there have been several systems implemented uh, in this form. James Gosling wrote a really um, impressive one for Java while he was at Sun. Lots of other people have played with this. The problem with it is that it doesn't work well at matching the implicit constructs in C++. You start having to invent pattern grammars to match implicit constructs. It gets really complex. The C++ grammar is already too complex. Actually writing out an explicit predicate <coughs> tends to be easier than coming up with uh, patterns. So that's, that's one of the key things. All right, so this is a real matcher, right? And if you want to go and write tools, you can now. Everything I have showed you is open source. It's all available. It actually builds and works, and you can get it today. Um, it's all in a branch of the Clang project. We're slowly merging all of it into the main line. There's only one piece that's left in the branch, and those are the AST matchers. Um, I also made sure that we had some of these examples checked in and actually building and available in the branch. So the, the rename that I walked through is actually checked in. Right, you can go look at it and go read the code. It has lots of comments to help you understand the stuff that I kind of glossed over here. And the CSER removal, um, the actual CSER removal is here as well. There's a lot more to this one. This one has lots of other logic to detect other patterns, other weird you know, constructs. Um, so feel free to go and pull these up. You can check out this branch of Clang. It's just a straight branch of the Clang repository. You can build it, try it out. Let me know if you have problems. And if I have time, I think I have like five minutes. You guys want questions or live demo? Demo. 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 Okay. Are you going to rerun your C stir tool for data? Um, we should actually. <laughs> okay. So first thing I want to be clear about. Uh, let's see. Can you guys see this? All right. Yeah. All right. So what I have here is a dummy CMake project. All right. It's it's really really boring. Uh, so <coughs> right, I have like some code. Uh, I'll show you the code real briefly. So these are the actual source files. They're really, really boring. There is nothing interesting going on here. Right? We define some get functions, different <coughs> translation units. We actually call them from other translation units. Right? There are operator overloads and other things in here. Not that any of that really matters. Um, and yeah, we have the, oh, have the header files, which are, again, really, really boring. I can show these in more detail if you want. But I don't think that's the interesting part. So first off, let's make sure this builds. Uh, Cool, it builds, right? And we can run it. Program runs, prints out 42 in all the places we expect it to. Now, go up to my little tool. Okay, so this is rename method. I just built it in my Clang LVM client on the side. So I run it. It's going to go and process all these files. All right. I like the, uh, the, the compilation database, too. Yes, so, so you can see the compilation database if you want. Um, Right, that's a compilation database for this thing. And now, so this is a, I already put this in git specifically so I could run git diff. So now you can see we've replaced all the declarations with get to front. Um, we catch, one of the ones I wanted to point out here, note that we catch this, right? This was, a, this was actually a member expression on get, but there's no member here. Again, we're able to match the implicit this arrow that shows up there and handle it in the exact same code path as we'd handle anything else. Right, we keep going and replace the virtual one in the base class, we get all this stuff. And in the demo, we replace all the calls to it. And if I go over, and the live demo gods are with me, 
and still compile some runs. So it actually does work. Right. All right, and I have like three minutes for questions. So we got some questions. I think you got your hand up first. So if you have a, uh, say you have a template um, that was only being instantiated for your foos and it was calling get, um, would it find a replacement? And then what about the case where the template is being instantiated sometimes for foos and sometimes for something totally unrelated? Um, it's a great question. So like the macro case, but not with macros. Yeah, the macro case, but not with macros. Um, we, I actually think we handle that one better. Um, we actually specifically don't met, modify the template okay. because in the template it's not it's not it's for an it's for an instantiation yeah. on the template parameter. But again, in all of the situations where you have these kind of you know dual uh, concerns, what we have to do is we have to back off and let the and let the, the programmer pick one. And you can you can find out whether what you have what you're looking at is a template instantiation or not, and, okay. and make a decision based on that. And you can even write stuff. So so one of the things that we've definitely seen written is uh, people will write two sets of predicates. Um, one which matches outside of template instantiations, and one which matches specifically inside of template instantiations, and tracks whether or not there are competing in template instantiations from some other type. It can flag those and then actually say, okay, these are the safe templates, these are the dangerous templates, we can print out the dangerous templates so if you can go deal with those, right, you can, you can actually handle that. So are there, are there explicit uh, disambiguators inside? So you, I can say, for example, uh, I've got two choices, pick uh, one. Uh, did I pop up the dialog or something? Um, no, it's not an interactive tool. It's right now it's structured entirely as a batch tool. But you can essentially write kind of in, in your actual matcher logic, you can you can batch them apart and, and handle them in separate runs. We, we just don't we just don't have it's not structured as an interactive tool. <laughs> and it'd be hard to do because one of the things we want to do is we want to be able to run this in, in many threads on your machine. And we'd actually really like to be able to farm it out if you have like a DCC cluster and it has a clang sitting around on it. One of the things we'd like to see what we can do is actually farm it out to your, your distributed build system so that even if you have tens and tens of thousands of files, you can still actually do these types of operations. So I can't actually add my own code, for example, to a place where it's um, found nope. back. They're just callbacks. You write the callbacks. You can so put any logic you want. I in the callback. Yeah. Um, I know you don't have a Windows backend, but could I build refactoring to it on Windows instead? Um, that requires parsing the Windows code, which has its own set of problems, um, which is a long and sorted story, but there's I mean no problem. C++ there. code. Hmm? I mean C++ code. Um, if it's strict standard C++ and uses no Windows code, yeah, it just works. Um, in fact, uh, uh, the guy who, like, so, so, so this is developed jointly between two teams, one in, in California and one in Munich. Um, and the, the guy in Munich who's actually done the lion's share of the work here, um, he actually implemented the rename tool last night um, on Windows and like tested it out on Windows. So yes, it does work. Had well, one thing I noticed that in Clang is you know when there are variations on the variable naming standard and then I see a commit that fixes it. Will you be using this tool to make a normalizer for the Clang code base? Um, that's a great question. A lot of people have asked whether we want to do um, coding convention stuff, and that's actually pretty high on the list of things to, to work on. Um, coding convention normalization is one of the really nice things. At the back, I saw a hand. Yeah, I'm going to ask for something completely unreasonable. Um, I want something that detects stuff that could be const expert, and it makes them. That's very easy to write. Wow, okay. <laughs> That's not unreasonable at all. Okay. Uh, so a so, uh, person on my team, Richard Smith, has an intern who's Got planning it. on writing a set of tools to detect code that could be shifted to C11 patterns beneficially and, and, and provide essentially a suite of standalone tools for that purpose. Okay, so it's it. Yes, yes. So, so automatically we're writing your for loops to range based for loops, constex, which actually use constex for uh, detecting fake variatics to actually use variatics. Wow. Um, yeah, all <laughs>